Greetings, everyone. Um, I'm Kathy Davidson, and um, founder of the Future District, and we're very happy to have you here. And I'm now going to back out of the way. Oh, Tina is trying to make yeah. some announcements, and then uh, Dr. we'll turn over to our amazing panel. Thank you all for being here today. It's really an honor to have everybody. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Um, my name is Katina Rogers. I'm the Director of Programs and Administration for the Futures Initiative. Um, I'm incredibly excited about today's event. Uh, Jessica and Adashima have been doing incredible work preparing for it, and I can't wait to hear from all of our, um, all of our speakers today. Um, I want to give you just a little bit of information about a couple things we have coming up. Um, we have some information about most of these over on the side table, but... Uh, just so that you know, um, on November 15th, from 3 to 4.30 p.m., we're going to be co-sponsoring an event on writing for the public. This is a workshop on writing op-eds, letters to the editor, different types of public engagement to share your research with a broader audience, um, which I think, especially for people who are here for today's session, um, could be really a powerful thing. Um, Tanya Domi, who works in the uh, Communications and Marketing Office here at the Grad Center, is going to be leading that. And then on December 6th, we're going to have our final event for the year, which is called um, Who is Included? Restructuring Our Work and Our World. And it's going to be addressing a number of different types of um, questions around access, um, inclusion, um, the ways that our physical spaces are structured for learning and how that impacts student outcomes, as well as some of the topics that we'll be talking about today. Um, so we hope that you will all join us for that. Um, in addition, there's uh, just a ton of workshops and events that are organized by the Teaching and Learning Center, the Office of Career Planning, Digital Initiatives, the Library, um, and I hope that you all will explore that through the, uh, the Grad Center's website or through, um, uh, through thank you, um, <laughs> academic comments. Um, today's event was organized, as I mentioned, by two of our graduate fellows, Jessica Murray, who is a doctoral student in developmental psychology and works on disability rights, mobilities, accessibility, transportation, and more and Adashima Oyo, who is a doctoral student in social welfare and works on inequality in both health and education, particularly for black and Latinx communities. But welcome, uh, Adashima and Jessica, and all of our panelists. So I want to welcome you to our event titled Equity, Health, and Learning, the Social Determinants of Academic Success. I want to let you know that this will be a collaborative talking discussion. We will be live streaming this whole entire event. So I encourage you, if you're on social media as well, to follow us on social media. Um, this will be a collaborative to talk. We're going to talk about some of the challenges that students face, some of the opportunities that students face, and how it might impact their success inside of the classroom. So specifically, our panelists, and hopefully you all too, will contribute to the conversation. We'll talk about the influence of having health insurance. We'll talk about the influence of transportation, um, disability, food, and just some of the general, um, I guess, social determinants that influence how students perform inside the classroom. Um, I will moderate the first part of the event. Um, my colleague Jessica will moderate the second half of the event, and we'll follow that with questions and answers at the end. So with that said, um, let's get started. I first want to um, give a brief bio for all of our panelists here, and then we'll have each of the panelists answer very targeted questions. So I want to start with Professor Nicholas Freudenberg. Uh, Nicholas Freudenberg is a distinguished professor of public health and social critical psychology at CUNY. He is also the director of Healthy CUNY, a university-wide initiative that promotes health for academic su success. For more than 30 years, uh, Professor Freudenberg has worked with the community organizations, social service agencies, government, and others to develop, implement, and evaluate policies and programs that promote more equitable access to education and health for children and young people. Please welcome Nicholas Freudenberg. Uh, next, we have Peggy Gross. Peggy Gross initiated travel training in the New York City Department of Education in 1970. Um, this initiative was developed for students with intellectual disabilities who aged out of school at the age of 17 years of age unless they could travel independently to their schools. Ms. Gross has a um, strong history of advocating for those with disabilities. Um, she also has a history of teaching um, disability history and talking about the disability rights movement inside of our education system. And she also has a lot of work with working with uh, parents, educators, and staff, and service providers agencies. Please welcome Peggy Gross. 
Next, we have Christopher Palmetto. Uh, professor Palmetto is an associate professor in the Community Health and Social Science Department at the CUNY School of Public Health and Health Policy. He teaches courses in health communication, social marketing, health advocacy, and conducts an online certificate program in social marketing. Um, as a Healthy CUNY Initiative <coughs> faculty fellow, his research is concerned with helping to improve student access to mental health and health insurance. He recently co-authored a textbook which covers personal health in the public health context. Please welcome Professor Christopher Palmetto, please. And finally, we have uh, Jesse Rice Evans. Uh, Jesse Rice is a queer um, femme uh, rhetor rhetorician. She is a PhD candidate at the Graduate Center in English. Her research focuses on the intersections of language, disability, and digital culture. She is the author of five books, including Honor, Shame, and she teaches queer text and composition at the City College of New York. Please welcome Jesse Rice. So now that we know a little bit about all of our panelists here, I would like to um, open up our first set of questions to Professor Freudenberg, and he's going to address those questions by also going to go over a few slides. So our, my question to Professor Freudenberg is, what are some of the uh, broader social issues that students face in determining their academic success? And are these barriers equally uh, distributed among students? So we'll allow Professor Freudenberg to answer this question, and then we'll open it up to the rest of the panelists to chime in. Thank you. Thank you. So, good afternoon. I already used up uh, a lot of my time. It's an honor to be here. Uh, and uh, I wanted to talk to you a little about Healthy CUNY, which is uh, a CUNY-wide initiative to promote the health of our 278,000 degree students and 250,000 uh, continuing education students in order to uh, promote their academic success. And Healthy CUNY was uh, founded about 10 years ago, and there's a team of faculty and students from community colleges to uh, here at the Graduate Center working with us. And one of my hopes of today's session is that some of you might be interested in joining some of this work. And the goals of Healthy CUNY are uh, some research goals to identify some of the barriers to academic, uh, the health-related barriers, health and social-related barriers to academic success, to find others, uh, student organizations, community organizations, other parts of CUNY, outside organizations who can address and reduce those barriers. Uh, we want to link students to health and social services. And we're an activist organization. We seek to mobilize students, policymakers, CUNY faculty and staff to take action on some of these issues. And I'm, by the way, happy to share the slides. Uh, there are more slides than I'm going to present today for those of you who might be interested. And in our work, both the surveys, and I'll show you some data from our surveys of representative samples of CUNY students in a couple minutes, we've identified four categories of problems that seem to be the most common. And we've both looked at the literature, and we've looked at our survey, uh, our most recent survey is a 2015 survey of a representative sample of 3,000 CUNY students. And the problems that we've identified are mental health problems, particularly depression and anxiety, uh, problems related to sexual and reproductive health. For some students, pregnancy uh, works out just fine. But for others, it can deter them from uh, proceeding through their education, particularly if their parenting is unsupported, and certainly for people who have uh, abusive or violent partners. Uh, we're also concerned about uh, students' access to health care through health insurance 
and uh, having a regular provider, and my colleague Chris Palmito will talk about that work in a few minutes. And we're also concerned about food insecurity. Uh, and I'll uh, maybe in the discussion period have a little time to talk about some of that work. And we see percolating through all of that uh, housing instability linked to mental health, linked to partner violence, linked to food insecurity. So th these are the data from our survey, uh, our 2015 survey, and they uh, really bring tears to my eyes every time I look at them, and I've looked at them a lot. And what they show you, if you look at the bottom rows, is that uh, almost half of CUNY students, this is uh, undergraduate students, almost half of CUNY undergraduate students face one or more of these seven problems. And almost one in five, more than one in five, face two or more of these problems. So that's the problem that we're confronting. Now, there's some good news. We did a similar survey in 2011, and we found that some of these problems diminished and others increased. If you look at no health insurance, no health care provider, or hungry in the last 12 months, you can see our findings in 2015 were uh, better. Fewer students were experiencing these problems than in 2011. And we believe the clear lesson from that is policy solutions make a difference. In the case of health care, it was the Affordable Care Act and the implementation. Uh, in the case of food security, it was food pantries, single stop, uh, as well as changes at the city, state, and federal level. And with depression and anxiety, uh, you can see where there weren't significant interventions, these problems got worse. Uh, I wanted to use my last little bit of time to uh, talk about where we are now, and this is where we hope to enlist you. Where uh, the uh, uh, Chancellor and Vice Chancellor for Student Services have appointed a task force on healthy CUNY that's been meeting for about the last six months. And we're proposing to develop in the next year or so what we're calling CUNY Health for Academic Success, a series of initiatives which we hope to test and evaluate on three or four CUNY campuses. And that initiative will look to strengthen faculty's ability to help their students get help for these health and social problems. It will use the dozens of peer education programs already on CUNY to help students help their peers. And we've been, uh, we uh, last semester ran uh, what we call the CUNY Food Security Advocates Program on the John Jay and Hustos campuses. And the year before, we trained uh, students to be mental health ambassadors at Bronx Community College and Lehman College. So we know that students want to help and can help, and we think they need some support to do that. Uh, third, we want to increase the number of uh, staff at the CUNY Mental Health Counseling Centers. The Student Services has estimated that they need about 30 additional staff throughout CUNY to meet the standards promoted by college health experts. So that's a big deficit that CUNY faces. We also want to establish partnerships with outside agencies and uh, we believe in the uh, participatory research and human-centered design, and so we hope to recruit a team of students, faculty, and staff to help design this intervention. And I'd be happy to answer questions about it as we proceed. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. So Professor Freudenberg just presented a wealth of data, so I now want to open up the question to the rest of the panelists here. What has been your experience? What are your thoughts about how some of these social conditions that students are facing outside of the classroom impact how well they do or don't do when they're inside of the classroom and you know anyone can jump in? Jesse Rice? Um, I've been teaching at City College for a couple of years as an adjunct, and my graduate center fellowship is also starting there in the spring. And I the, the data that you presented on depression and anxiety increasing um, really struck me as uh, as true in my experience. When I get the opportunity to speak one-on-one -on -one with my students, which unfortunately I don't get a lot of time to do, um, they're confessing all kinds of mental health struggles that they're having, 
and expressing the lack of resources that they have available. So seeing that in a chart form, which is a little bit out of my comfort zone in my discipline, but that's fine. Uh, seeing some data illustrated was really um, profound. Thank you for showing. Others, what are your thoughts about how these how these uh, conditions might impact how students do inside the classroom? I think the issue on anxiety and depression brings up the whole issue of disability mm -hmm. and whether or not the level of anxiety or depression is such that it would meet the barrier or the bar regarding disability. And if that is the case, what is the impact of a perceived disability or a real disability on someone functioning academically well? And what is the reaction of others to the individual who has that? I think they are major, major things. Anything that resembles disability, particularly anything in the cognitive or mental health range, brings up a whole whole history of things that people would have to deal with. And I'd be very interested in learning more about that. So um, my next question is to uh, Professor Palmetto. So, you know, Nick gave us some of the broader issues that students might be facing. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more about some of the issues regarding their health insurance, how that might impact um, how they're doing inside of the classroom. <coughs> Sure. Would you like me to step up there? It's up to you. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I can sit here, I guess. Okay. I don't even know. Yeah. It works. But it's great to see such a full house. That's wonderful. So I, I, maybe I'll use the microphone a little bit. Um, so, yeah, my name is Chris Palmetto. I didn't ask a question, Nick, because I, I sit right next to my office and Jason, too. So I can ask him a question anytime. <laughs> but I do have and we questions. ask each other every day. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so I, I uh, this this work I just had a, a piece published in about this research um, about a, about a month ago. But the project started four years ago. It all started four years ago. Uh, I had just joined uh, the CUNY School of Public Health, and um, four years ago, uh, Barack Obama was president of the United States, and the ACA was ready to go. It was. It had been implemented in some ways, but it was just getting ready to be implemented in a large scale. We had these three different types of plans available, the bronze, the silver, the gold, and um, everybody was ready to be deployed to get people signed up. And we at the School of Public Health recognized that that's really important to get people signed up, but we really needed to sign up young people, first of all, because it's important for them to have health insurance so they don't have health issues that will let them drop out of school. But also young people are important to be in the system because they generally are healthier, cost less, and you want them to feed into the community um, rated insurance model. So our dean uh, funded a lot of insurance navigators to get people signed up, and we uh, recruited faculty, including myself, who I have a background in communications, and so we developed a big social media campaign we had all kinds of um, Instagram, and Facebook, and it was very, very active. And we had tabling, we had fun games that students did, and we recruited uh, uh, students for insurance in the three Bronx campuses, because that had the greatest need, we thought. So Bronx Community College, Hostos, um, and uh, Lehman College. And so it was great, it was very exciting, people were very interested, a lot of activity on social media. And then at the end of the campaign, we, we saw that not many people signed up. And a lot of people did end up getting signed up for Medicaid. They were eligible for Medicaid. They didn't even really realize it. In conversations with the navigators, they found out they were. So we enrolled them in Medicaid. But why didn't they get signed up for the other plans? And so we decided that instead of doing more recruitment, let's go back to the drawing board and do some research and actually answer that question. Why didn't they? So um, I got a grant for PSC CUNY grant. And we did focus groups with BMCC students and with City College students, and we interviewed some of the people that are most responsible for recruiting students into the into healthcare at CUNY. And those involve people at CUNY Central. They involve people um, at for-profit insurance companies that enroll students in health insurance and go on campuses to do that. Um, and uh, a variety of, uh, of people, people at single stop. So what did we find out? So our questions were, you know, how important is healthcare to you? Uh, what do you think of health care? What are the barriers to getting health insurance? And how can CUNY make it easier for you? So what did they say? 
But before I tell you what they said, I only have a, a, a minute or so more, uh, I do need to ask you to tell me what you think. It wouldn't be a, a, a futures initiative event if I didn't <laughs> engage everybody. So you are, you are on the live stream. Anybody can hear us, hashtag. Tell us, because this research still is still going on. This research doesn't end. It's, it's, um, it's not over until we have every single CUNY student have health insurance, right? So you tell us, what did we find out? Well, first of all, we found out that there were about 10% of uh, students who were uninsured. That's pretty good, actually, um, but that's still 25,000 people, right? And that happened in a lot because of the ACA. Um, they uh, are confused. That's one thing we heard. Uh, they don't feel their college or university is helping much. People who enroll students don't feel that CUNY, um, uh, the, the people who actually enroll the students, you know, the, the actual enrollers, they don't feel that like CUNY is supporting them. Um, and many students don't even know about the resources available. In one of our focus groups, a student told another student, do you even know what single stop is? And the student said, no. Well, let me tell you about single stop. And students started saying, you know, we need to have these like footsteps that take you to single stop. Single shops should be right there in front of you. We need to normalize the fact that students have needs of health insurance and services. Why is it that Coke machines all pop up everywhere? Coke wants you to have a Coke within arm's reach of, ev of every human in the world. And I'm trying to get these Coke, in our school, at our staff meeting yesterday, there, was a co there were a bunch of Coke. How does that happen, and yet they can't figure out where their health department, their health office is, or the single stop office? Because the health department's down the hall, downstairs, or upstairs, and out of reach. So we need to denormalize um, the fact that people need services. They need food, they need health insurance, and we need to get more people to talk about it. And so um, that's what we're trying to do. Thank you. So I opened up that question to the other panelists as well. How, how do we you know, get people to talk about it? How do we get students to know more about it? Because I feel that sometimes it's, it's fairly easy to tell students, you know, sign up for health insurance. We have these services available. But how do we connect the dots to get them to enroll in services and to make sure that they're receiving quality health care services? More importantly, well, the quality's tough, but uh, <laughs> that, that's that's that, you know, do we have three hours? No, we don't. Uh, <laughs> we have but I can days. say we did hear from enrollers, we heard from CUNY itself, and we heard from the students some ideas. One idea I'll just leave with, with and I, I think that it, should, it shouldn't be that hard. When a student enrolls in classes, why can't CUNY just say, Are you insured? Mm -hmm. And if the answer is no, why not? Here's your options you may qualify for Medicaid, you may be interested in. Um, one of these other plans, CUNY doesn't even do that. All it is is it's very simple. So simple communications, we found that communications is important. Faculty can do more about telling their students what's real so we can, we can channel mm -hmm. to faculty this information. Um, but there's some very simple little sort of social marketing uh, projects, that, you know, uh, things that can be implemented very easily. And we're going to be presenting that kind of information to CUNY later this year. Excellent. So I just want to give an example of one of the things that I do when I teach is that I put on the syllabus on the last page that this is where the health center is inside of the school. Like this free service is part of your tuition, like engaging these services. Even if you have to come to class late or miss class, I want you to go and make sure you're getting the health care service that you need. So I, I do Thank think it's important that, that we, we, we consider some real, um, you know, applicable things that we can do to sort of get this, the ball moving and help sort ensure that students are receiving the insurance that they need and the, and the care that they need. So do others want to comment? We have a few more minutes inside this section to comment about uh, health insurance and how we can get students enrolled and how that might impact their services. Hi. Uh, is there a way that, uh, you talked about uh, single stop, is there a way that your group could bring a health care or health insurance expert just to come there for one, once a week, like they have for tax preparation and legal services, just to come to every campus they do that. They actually do that. Single stop. They come uh, in all the community colleges and John Jay. Single stop offers a health insurance enroller. That, what's one of the people we interviewed uh, to ask them what was easy and what's difficult and what are the barriers and what are the facilitators. So they actually do that. They do that. Once and I think our experience with single stop is they're terrific for people who walk through their door. But our surveys show that a significant proportion of students, in some cases up to 80%, don't know that that's available on their campus. And we think both students and faculty have the potential to do outreach and education in some of the ways that you talked about and you talked about. We, uh, on a different issue, uh, food security, we at uh, Healthy CUNY did a guide about how faculty and staff 
can connect students to services. It's on our website and I'll pass it around for people to look at. And I think some of those uh, strategies are the same for health insurance. Could you tell us, uh, for people who don't know what single stop is? Uh, well, Nick, do you? <laughs> sure, Single Stop is a national program that uh, uh, screens uh, uh, people, clients, students for eligibility for, I think, 30 different public benefit programs, including Medicaid, SNAP, mm -hmm. WIC. Uh, it also helps people to prepare taxes. And uh, it's located on the community colleges in John Jay. CUNY has said. Uh, a goal is to have it on every campus in the next five years, and we ought to be putting pressure on the uh, Board of Trustees and our, uh, and our new Chancellor to realize that aspiration. Uh, and and uh, Single Stop is also located in other social service agencies uh, around but the that's, city. But that's country. the point, is that there, it's available, but it needs to be, and the students told us, as I said, they, they said, you know, like, those footprints that you see, mm -hmm. you know, on the ground, like they don't, they don't, they don't even know that it's on campus. Can I, can we call on this individual? Because I like yeah, the way she was snapping when I mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like so passionate about it because I know. Oh, I am from BNCC. So when uh, I moved here, moved here two years ago, and also I started be, going to BNCC two years ago, and it was like, you know, how hard is it for someone who is coming from a totally different country and. You need a lot of resources and everything. And BMCC got single stop and counseling center. These two features are the best features of our school. I should say that because throughout my two years, like I'm graduating this semester, like I have always been either counseling center or single stop. And I'm mentoring like two students and they really don't know like where is single stop and counseling center. I was like, sister. You need to know these two Thank places. You. This is the most important places of our school. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much yeah. for doing that. I have a question. Um, I'm from education in the Department of Ed, okay? That's my background. In terms of preparing young people to leave school and to continue, in terms of preparing their teachers, their guidance counselors and all their support staff, are you reaching into the schools of education, psychology, and social work to be sure that they know that that is part of their job, particularly in education or guidance, that this is what needs to be done both with parents and with the youth before they leave school. They have to be made aware of it. And I think we miss that sometimes in teacher preparation. I agree. Uh, the uh, CUNY School of Public Health has been working with the New York City Health Department around something called the Thrive Initiative, uh, which is an effort to promote mental health throughout New York City. And one of the areas where we were involved was to look at what's the mental health workforce that New York City needs that will be uh, representative of the diverse population of New York City, able to speak the right languages, to know the cultures, uh, to be able to help people uh, who, uh, who, who might have different beliefs about mental health than, uh, than others. And uh, we work closely with, uh, uh, with the psychology, social work, mental health counseling programs. I think much more could be done with education because school counselors and teachers play a critically important role in mental health. And I think uh, they need more training and folk, folks working in the health and mental health sector need to know how to better talk to and work with uh, people in the school system. Mm -hmm. okay. So we're going to just turn it over to Jessica who's going to ask a few uh, questions to the parents. But I encourage you all, if you have questions, jot them down. We're going to have a Q&A uh, question section at the end. But continue the questions. They're great questions, Jessica. Yeah. So um, yeah, we're going to transition a little bit into some different topics um, about transportation and disability. And um, kind of the point of this conversation was um, me and Adashima had to kind of come up with a way to connect these seemingly disparate um, topics of um, health, access to health care and food security and also, um, you know, access to transportation and disability. And I think all of these topics don't get enough um, 
attention in, in institutional conversations and settings. So I think um, this is a really fascinating conversation to be having. Um, and we've already kind of seen how these um, issues intersect already with the, the mental health um, issues that we know we need to address. Um, so I wanted to invite Peggy, not only because of her more than 50 years of experience uh, working as an educator in New York City, um, but also her awareness of transportation and how it, it ties into the big picture um, of achieving our goals in higher education. Um, and we also wanted to hear um, a student perspective, and so I'm glad Jessica can be here with us today to talk about not only her experiences as a disabled student, but um, also as a teacher. Um, so Peggy, I'll start with you. Um, can you talk a little bit about the importance of transportation within um, higher education, um, which is something that most of us take for granted? Um, and what should educators know about how transportation barriers can impact students' academic success? I'll start by saying I assume we all got here today. <laughs> <laughs> and whether you walked, mm -hmm. drove, used public transit or private transit, you had to move from point A to point B. You don't get anywhere. You're not going to get your health care. You're not going to get your food stamps. You're not going to get your food from a food pantry. You're not going to get to a soup kitchen. You're not going to get to the doctor for other services unless you can get from A to B. How often do we talk about the role that transportation plays in every aspect of your life? Every single aspect of your life has a part of it that will include movement from point A to point B. It is ignored. I have never taken a course in education or seen a description of the role of transportation. What are the policies that have to be in place? I did travel training with the Department of Ed and the number of young people who were leaving high school, going to college, who had never, ever, ever crossed the street, been on a public bus alone, ridden a subway alone, was incredible. These are young people with disabilities going to leave a high school, having traveled all the time on a school bus, to come to one of your campuses. You want them to succeed? That's sort of a huge jump to make. They not only have to deal with all of the unfamiliar people, the different schedules, but all of a sudden door-to-door -door service and learning how to deal with the reality. It is not their inability or the presence of a disability that kept them from using public transportation, it was us. It was you, it was me, it was the school system, it was society in general, it was our attitudes, our not looking at being sure that the barriers are removed. There was one young woman who had a, a Chinese American background and she did very well in high school. She used a wheelchair. She had never used her wheelchair alone on a sidewalk. Her family and, of course, all of our wonderful agencies that say what services you need had always made sure that somebody was there to push her chair. She was going to come from some place in Brooklyn to Baruch. We were asked to travel train her. She had never, ever navigated on the sidewalk through people. Never. Extremely bright academically, functionally, a large part of which we forget has to be incorporated into academic success, or it means nothing, had been overlooked. We did teach her to travel. She took longer than someone with more intellectual disabilities because of her lack of experience, because we don't teach 
teachers that transportation is a critical skill. Education journals do not deal with it. Psycho psychology journals do not deal with it. The only ones that will deal with it are transit agencies. What are we overlooking in our policies? What are we forgetting in our practices? What does academic success mean if you can't go anywhere with your degree? Yes, that's such a crucial point. Um, do, do either of you want to respond to how transportation and access to healthcare are, are related? Well, I would say one thing. I had a, uh, I'm interested in my background, you know, my professional area is communications, and I'm interested in um, how transportation is framed around health. So, and I actually had a student, a, you know, doing their final project in a master's program at the School of Public Health, study the history of, of bicycle infrastructure in New York City. And what, we, what, what he did was do a content analysis of all the media coverage to see how it was framed. And how it was framed was around um, uh, congestion mm -hmm. and uh, environment, so reducing emissions. Not, it was not hardly at all. There was almost no mention of the fact that people's cardiovascular health stands to improve by biking around. And the interest, it's always a, seems to always be about these other bigger issues. And I don't know why, but health always seems to get short shrift in these conversations. Mm -hmm. Just two two observations. I think the question. Uh, in all the topics we're talking about is what would an equitable uh, city look like and what would be an equitable transportation system. We had a student at uh, John Jay, uh, uh, one of our food security advocates, tell us that she had to decide between using the money she got from John Jay to pay for her subway fare, a, a, a great move to help people finish their education, to use that for herself to come to school or to feed her kids. And I think uh, the people have probably heard about the fair fare program, which will uh, subsidize or provide half fare. You know, when I turned 65, I got a 50% reduction in the subway fare. Why should that be only older people and not every CUNY student uh, who, who gets those discounts? And we really need to think about our transportation system policies and how do they contribute to equity? How do they contribute to people being Full participating members of our society. Do you have anything else to add about transportation or your own? <laughs> no, just um, I I appreciated your way of communicating about the experiences that you've had and about the lack of interest almost um, in something so quotidian as like how you get from point A to point B. But when you're disabled, you have to think about it. Thank you so much. When you're disabled, you have to think about point A to point D all the time. It is, um, I hope for wherever you go back into your studies or your teaching, that you reflect on the role that transportation plays in your lives. Every one of us, or the majority of us, are going to have some form of disability at some point in our life. And if we don't start to deal effectively with the attitudes and the barriers that those attitudes create regarding it, we're going to have problems. So um, now I have some questions for Jesse. Um, so from a student perspective, uh, one with disabilities, uh, what accessibility or other challenges have you faced? And how have you applied your personal experience to your teaching? You know, I didn't prepare anything to say because I was like, I can just talk about it. <laughs> but I've been, um, I'm a PhD student. I'm a white, cisgender, queer woman. I'm not, I have access in so many ways that other people with disabilities don't have, but I've still been amazed by the sheer amount of um, total disregard for access needs from my professors, um, from gatekeepers at my school, 
from supervisors in my teaching roles. It's been um, really startling for me as a person who somewhat recently developed a, a disability. As far as how it's affected my teaching, that I took a note of. As y'all were talking, I was thinking of all of the ways that the things that you all brought up show up when I'm interacting with my students. Um, one of the biggest things was thinking about access in broader terms than just a groovy ringtone. Thinking about access in broader terms than just a, a wheelchair ramp mm. or an automatic door button. So I wrote down some things. Access is using phones and electronic devices in classes. It's expanding the definitions of participation. It's flexible attendance policies. It's hybridized courses and integrating technology into classes at all levels, including uploading all lecture notes to the course site and having an active course website that is accessible from a mobile device. It's valuing how students teach and learn from one another and integrating collective collaborative work in the classroom. Being disabled has had an enormous impact on how I, I think about my students. I went into teaching in a college classroom thinking I was gonna be so tough. I'm gonna be, have all the rules, and I'm gonna force them, I'm gonna just be, no, hard, hard, what is it, tough love. But I went in and I realized that they're all people. <laughs> And life can be extremely difficult if there's any, if you have any type of embodied identity that marks you as other, and that comes with oppression, be it disability, racialized, or racialized experience, um, being trans or gender nonconforming, visibly queer, fat, I mean, the list goes on. Once I realized that, that we had so much in common, and that I could relate to them on this person-to-person -person level. I, I wouldn't use the word lax, but maybe my students would use the word lax <laughs> about me and my, my teaching policies. Forgiveness and empathy is a huge part of that for me. I am consistently thinking about what kind of teacher I needed as an undergraduate student with mental health disabilities and doing whatever I can to be that person for my previous self and for my students from whom I learn so much. Um, um, um to think how to to relate tie this back to um, access and I think what you said about um, kind of having to empathize with um, what people are experiencing outside of the classroom is, is kind of the thread of this whole conversation um, that there are these these outside factors that we can't always see when a student comes into the classroom we have certain assumptions based on their physical appearance and um, what we perceive to be their abilities um, and so, yeah, thinking about um, all of these kind of outside factors is really important. So um, just want to open it up if anyone else wants to comment on um, kind of some of the institutional barriers and, that exist uh, for people with disabilities and how we can combat those. I have a question for, for you, Jesse. Um, you mentioned mental health disability. And uh, if you were to talk to the um, founder and director of Healthy CUNY, which concerns itself with the mental health of all CUNY students and a faculty fellow of Healthy CUNY, and to tell them what Healthy CUNY might do, yeah. what initiatives we could do to improve mental health and, um, at CUNY, yeah. what would you say? I think, I think that's a really hard question. Thanks so much. It's, a, it's too hard. Sorry, I, I apologize. Actually. <laughs> Especially because you're on the spot. Wow. <laughs> I mean, come on, we're here. That's a little way to weaken our muscles. I know, I know. I just dump your problems. <laughs> oh my God. 
you know, honestly, I think um, some of the stuff that I that I read from my uh, accessibility device, my cell phone, which is with me everywhere. Um, I think some of those ideas of like expanding what access means, mm -hmm. I think that's really crucial. And that means that we all need to have some maybe conversations that we're uncomfortable having as abled people and disabled people talking together, um, listening to students who self-identify as disabled is enormous. A lot of times I think we think we know what's best for our students. We don't, unless they ask for it. I'd like to make a comment to something that you were saying. Communicating is critical. I think the two biggest things in anyone's life are a system of communication and a system of mobility because everything else is dependent on them. And I think where educators fail, and by educators I mean people who are involved in any aspect of teaching from early intervention through PhDs and postgraduate studies, okay, any of it. And I would include the medical profession most definitely. We don't know how to talk to people about their disability. We know how to take the words we read in a text. We know how to take the words that are in the law. We don't know how to talk to you. We don't know how because we are always and have been schooled in the concept that we will provide for, we will take care of. There is this to do or that to do. And so all of these things come in and we don't know how to talk. And I think one of the biggest things that we have to learn is how little we know. I, at this point, do not know what it is like to live with a disability. So, why am I an authority on it? Why am I the expert? Why do I tell someone what it is like? I don't know. I only know what I have read, written by somebody else who may not have a disability also. So I think there is a great deal of uh, humility we have to learn in order to be able to break through any of these barriers and to try to reach any concept of equity and access in our schooling, in our employment, in our communities. I, uh, uh, I guess it's a dilemma that uh, I think about a lot when we think about a healthy community, and that's how to, on the one hand, acknowledge that uh, people who identify themselves or are identified in a certain category, whether it's people with disability or people with a mental health condi condition or LGBT, uh, have the full protection of the institution for embracing that identity. But also, because what I see in every category we've looked at, there's a continuum. And on mental health, uh, there are many more people with uh, symptoms, with mental health system, symptoms that could go one way or the other mm -hmm. into healthier or into meeting that definition of DSM-4 or 5 of, of being yeah. mentally ill. And how do we not uh, reify those categories, but at the same time give people the protection that they deserve? Mm -hmm. And I think there's a concept that we've lately come up with that we think is the a deep goal for CUNY, which is to create what we call a culture of caring. That whatever, however you self-identify, however you're identified, that you uh, will feel that CUNY cares about you, that the faculty and staff and your peers care about you. And in the work that Chris and I have done, uh, leading focus groups on, on several CUNY campuses, what we find is when students don't feel that, and a lot of CUNY students don't. They feel like CUNY is just another institution like their high schools or the welfare department or the city government that regards them based 
on their race or their gender or their immigration status and not on who they are as a human being. And what would it take to transform the culture here at CUNY that it was more a culture of caring and less a culture that was stratified by all those uh, social categories? If, if we could figure that out, I think we would do much better as an educational institution, as a social institution. A really great point. Um, so I think this conversation is a lot larger than we have time for. Um, but I did want to mention that um, on the program, there was a bit.ly link. Um, and that's kind of our public notes document. Um, and we also put some additional readings in there that kind of expands on these topics. And if you wanted to add your own readings that you have found that are crucial, um, feel free to add those. Anyone can edit that document. Um, but we do have time for a couple of questions if anyone um, wants to go ahead. Hi, I'm Cherish. I wanted to ask a question relating to something that was said previously about healthcare facilities on college campuses being like downstairs behind corridors. I wanted to know why is it that healthcare facilities on high school campuses are actually more noticeable, more readily available for students as opposed to on college campuses where it's like you have to seek out the information about the healthcare facilities. What's like the difference? Why is that <coughs> the way it is? Well, I mean like it's anyone's opinion. <laughs> I'll just quickly say that, my, first of all, I think that's part of the reason the students were so startled at, at the, uh, that they weren't available in college, because they were so available in high school, for one thing. But also, I do think that you know, high school like, is, is that time when a lot of issues are starting to emerge, sexual health relationships, and all these issues are um, you know, right front and center with, with the school. But uh, having said that, I don't, I don't think those issues go away in college, and, and it's an important thing. That, that really should be addressed. It should be dealt with. Just three quick thoughts. One, I think uh, for a long time the CUNY administration, the central administration, felt like health wasn't part of their job. They said, we're educators, we're underfinanced by the state and city government, and all we can do is make sure that people you know, uh, graduate, accumulate their credits. I think our argument is that our job is to make sure people graduate. And if you're hungry, you don't graduate. If you're sick, you don't graduate. And if we want to be held accountable for our graduation and retention rates, then we have to take on all the obstacles that students face. Second point is, uh, if you go to Columbia or NYU, they do have full health services, and you can find them. Uh, and that's because they have more resources, and it's also because students live on campus. I don't believe it's in the cards, for better or worse, for CUNY to have full service health services on campus. But I think what the university could do a much better job at is connecting to the many healthcare and social service agencies in the city. And by developing a relationship with health and hospitals, with the 60 community health centers, with the mental health centers in New York City. And we're pushing really hard to get the central administration to say, well, let's look at how we can ensure that CUNY students can get to the uh, community health center in their neighborhood or can get to the hospital. And then the last thing I'll say, uh, an analogy that we think about is uh, same as within healthcare, in high school and elementary schools, people get food. There aren't uh, hungry uh, or there shouldn't be hungry uh, high school students because there's food available for lunch. And what would it take to have a national uh, college food program so that we didn't have hungry college students. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, my name is Alexis Kervis. I, um, I'm a professor up at the Silverman School of Social Work. I'm so gratified by everything that you all have said, and it's so wonderful to hear about all of this. Um, we, I have not been previously exposed to this, and I've been here a while, so it's it, that's one thing about communication, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Not even the faculty are aware of some of the resources that we could be offering our students. I would agree the depression and anxiety piece. Um, I'm, I'm so grateful I'm a licensed mental health clinician in addition to my teaching because I'm often, often doing suicide assessments on my students. But the, the issue that I think hasn't, you briefly mentioned it, Professor Furtenberg, about the um, housing instability. I would say a very good proportion of my graduate students are homeless. And just curious about 
how can we as a community begin to address something given that we don't have dorms, we don't have on-campus housing like NYU, for example. Yeah, and, and in our research, uh, housing instability is the strongest predictor of academic problems. Our data show uh, from 2015 about 13% of CUNY students face some measure of housing instability, not being able to pay the next month's rent to being homeless. The number who are actually homeless seems to be uh, quite a bit smaller. Uh, again, I think this is a social problem. Many population uh, groups in New York City uh, uh, lack uh, access to affordable housing. And uh, I, I think there's a very clear demarcation point for those of us who've been in New York City for a long time. Until uh, the early 1980s, homelessness was mostly a problem of uh, older men, a lot of them white, and it was uh, in relation to drug and alcohol problems. And with the end of federal support for affordable public housing in the 1980s with the Reagan administration, we saw that homelessness became a problem for women, children, families, and even college students. And we're going to need to change those uh, federal policies, state policies, and city policies to make uh, expanding access to affordable housing for college students and everybody. And there's an election next Tuesday, and I hope you all go <laughs> to uh, move us in the right direction on that. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Um, this uh, entire discussion has been so very edifying, so just say thank you to everyone. Um, but I think um, one of y'all made a sort of important sort of reminder that everyone will become disabled at some point in your life. But I think it's just as important to keep in mind that not everyone becomes equally disabled, right? It's mm -hmm. a compounding thing, um, especially, um, and of course it's compounded by like racism, especially by like, black racism, class status and gender to body, et cetera. And I think when we're talking about increasing access to disability services, that's an incredibly important conversation to have. But at the same time, that doesn't ensure that disability services are necessarily safe for all bodies. Um, so perhaps talking about um, the white heterosexist um, supremacist patriarchy is um, <laughs> way too large of a question to um, the very end of this presentation. So are there ways that any of you approach making disability services safer in general for everyone to access, especially folks from marginalized or targeted identities, especially? Do you have suggestions for I mean, if there were funding for um, for widespread trainings for staff who work in disability services, I think that would be really optimal. I think, again, though, they should hire a disabled person to train, to do some of that training. Um, and as and expanding that training into being more inclusive of um, racialized identities, et cetera, hiring a person from each of those backgrounds to conduct that training, I think is the best option. Um, let's find money for that to pay people who need to get paid. And just to further echo the point that uh, Jesse is making, I think that whether we're talking about disability, whether we're talking about housing, transportation, whatever the issues that we're talking about, we need to make sure that we are bringing uh, you know, various stakeholders to the table when we're making these decisions, when we're coming up with these policies, when we're raising what these questions are. So when we talk about you know, why are the health services all the way down the hole in the basement, you know, part of that is like we need to have students involved, student representation about how these decisions are being made. And even when we talk about some of the issues that the students are facing as far as insurance and their housing and how they can be more empathetic to students' issues, I feel like oftentimes we have a lot of decisions that are being made at a, at a very high level, at a very administrative level, where there's oftentimes a lack of diversity, yes. people who all look the same, think the same, and I think we need to make sure that there's greater efforts to bring in you know, students' voices, to bring in voices of others, whether they are disabled or LGBTQ or, or black or African American. I just think that, that that is important for when we're making these decisions and, and trying to understand why people utilize services or what some of their barriers might be. Yeah. And, and CUNY, as an educational institution, uh, really has an opportunity and an obligation. So it's 
it's, it's not only the content of the training and the number of trainings, but who we admit to our university mm -hmm. yeah. to make sure that in every area, disability, uh, mental health, uh, food security, uh, social work, education, that the students uh, that we admit and graduate reflect uh, New York City and Absolutely. the range of population needs. And we could be doing much better at that. Yes, right. And at all levels, not just yeah. at the undergraduate level, but at the yes. graduate yes. level, at the doctoral level. It should be at the faculty level. At the faculty yes. level. Yes. Yes. yes, at all yes. levels. So we need to see some diversity. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that's a great note to end on. Uh, thank you all for coming. And